All right. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello and welcome everyone to Politics and Pros Live. My name is Vashon. I am part of the event staff of Politics and Pros. Uh, before we do get started this evening, uh, a couple quick things I wanted to go over. The first is that um, at any time during this event, you'll be able to go to the chat section, uh, which you can find towards the bottom of the stream. Um, you'll be able to use a link in there that will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of The Great Secret. Uh, we, of course, highly encourage that as that um, what helps, you, helps us bring these events to you. Um, other thing is we would ask, just so we can uh, keep everything kind of organized, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask of the author, we would ask for you to place them separately in the Q&A box, which is also towards the bottom of the stream. Um, that would just assist us with facilitating the questions. Um, finally, what I would like to say is um, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Jeanette Conant and Dr. Michael Nevins here uh, this evening. Jeanette is a New York Times bestselling author of several books, which include Tuxedo Park, 109 East Palace, The Irregulars, and the critically acclaimed Man of the Hour. Uh, Jeanette is going to be joined in conversation tonight by Dr. Michael Nevins. Dr. Nevins attended Dartmouth College and Tufts Medical School. He opened his practice, which was focused on cardiology and internal medicine in 1968, and he enjoyed a long and distinguished medical career until retirement in 2012. Dr. Nevins is himself an author who has written many articles in medical journal, journals and several books on the subjects of medical history and medical ethics. And without any further ado, Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here tonight, um, virtually, not in person. I'd rather be there in person getting a cup of coffee and cake downstairs first, but we're going to do it this way instead. Michael, it's great to see you tonight. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. I first stumbled across this story when I was uh, working on a biography of my grandfather, James B. Conant, who was a famous chemist and a president of Harvard. And he was tapped by President Roosevelt to be one of the leaders of the Manhattan Project during World War II. And during that time, my grandfather was in charge of all chemical weapons, um, the largest chemical weapon of all being the bomb, of course, but he was also in charge of developing poison gas. And when I was going through his papers, um, I was very surprised to find a reference to a poison gas incident and hundreds of poison gas casualties during World War II. Because probably like most people, I assumed that poison gas was a weapon of World War I. It had been banned by the Geneva Convention after that war for being such a terrible and inhumane weapon. And I was under the impression it had never been used in World War II. So I was intrigued and I started digging and the more I dug, the more I learned, the more interested I became. And eventually, I, I uncovered the story of this young army doctor, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander, who um, was assigned the task of investigating this chemical weapons disaster during World War II. And he wrote a landmark report about it that would change the course of medical history. And it was just amazing to me, uh, having written five books on World War II and, and having read literally hundreds, that I knew nothing about this story. And I was also amazed that while I found reference to it in medical textbooks, um, it was little more than a footnote. And it mentioned the Bari event in passing as galvanizing the whole field of um, chemotherapy, but it never mentioned um, the doctor that wrote the report by name. And I was also interested, I guess, that the doctor's breakthrough um, insight into, into poison gases curative potential was always described in, in the medical history books as a chance discovery, a sort of serendipitous epiphany. And that kind of irritated me. Um, the, the famous French chemist, Louis Pasteur, who discovered that microorganisms uh, cause disease, once famously said, in the field of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. 
In other words, an alert and observant doctor, when confronted with strange and contradictory evidence, will draw on his intelligence and his experience and his training to make a single unexpected leap. So it's not luck, but it's intuition, a kind of informed deduction, if you will, that leads scientists and doctors to make great discoveries. Dr. Alexander recognized the never before seen symptoms in a group of dying sailors, and he realized it might have life-saving implications for others. And he insisted that his insight be reported despite Churchill's efforts to silence him. And he made sure his findings would be further examined by top researchers in the United States. So the story of my book is not just the story of serendipity. It's the story of how one very determined young doctor turned a chemical weapons accident into an opportunity and a horrific World War II tragedy into a medical triumph. Um, Dr. Alexander was a very interesting young man and he had an interesting background. He was a, a brilliant student. His father was a doctor. He entered Dartmouth College at 15 and he got his medical degree very quickly on an advanced track. And he eventually earned his MD from Columbia. And then he joined his father's practice in New Jersey. But um, it was a family of, from a family of immigrants who came to the United States and were extremely grateful for the opportunity and the freedom that this country afforded them. And he felt a very deep uh, obligation and duty to serve his country. So he notified the uh, draft board in 1941 very early that he would be ready to serve at any time. And uh, so he answered one of the first calls to serve in the army. Um, Dr. Uh, Michael Nevins uh, knew him, was a protege of Dr. Alexander's and worked with him in New Jersey. Michael, what kind of, of person was he? And, and, uh, and what did you know about his World War II background? <laughs> Well, the, as far as the last part, very, very little. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Bashan, I opened my uh, medical practice with a friend in 1968 um, in the town next to Park Ridge where Stewart uh, practiced along with his father. He already had a distinguished medical career. He was beloved by his patients. He was well respected by the medical community had uh, various important positions in addition to practice. And over the next two decades, I came to think of him as more than just a senior colleague, but as a friend. And, and in retrospect, I came to regard him as my medical mentor. Um, he succeeded his father in a medical practice that dated back to our area's first doctor who opened shop uh, or hung, hung, hung up the shingle, if they did that in those days, in 1865, just after the Civil War. And by the time my friend retired because of failing health, that three generation practice had been active for 117 years. And it seemed to me that they never threw anything out. Mm -hmm. um, he sometimes showed me old equipment, uh, stethoscopes, micros microscopes, photographs, medical records, and we both loved poring over those artifacts together. And whenever we happened to meet up while making rounds at our local hospital, it seemed that Stuart always had a fascinating story to tell about the old time docs and the, and the good old days or bad old days. And once when I asked him, why didn't he write it all down in a book? He laughed and said he was too busy that I should do it. Well, that sounded ridiculous, but it's true. I wasn't very busy then, but it's exactly what happened. In fact, over the ensuing years, I, I wrote about a dozen books on various aspects of medical history. But, Did he ever talk to you about the Bari incident? Well, there was, one subject that Dr. Alexander never discussed, it, and that was the Barry incident, and in fact, his experiences during World War II. I, I was dimly aware uh, that he'd been on General Eisenhower's staff uh, in North Africa, where he met his eventual wife, Bunny Bernice, uh, who headed the nursing corps. And I recall he, he once mentioned, I think, that they were going down to Washington for the weekend to 
meet with their good friends, Ike and Mamie at the White House. But more than that, more detail than that se seemed to be off limits. And I had no reason to, to push him for details. Uh, now I regret that. Um, he was quite a, a modest man, um, Dr. Alexander. And he, my understanding is that he really never told his colleagues about his wartime heroics. Um, and it all really came out um, when um, the story started to be declassified in the 1970s. And bit by bit, his colleagues, including uh, Dr. Nevins, uh, began to learn for the first time about uh, Stuart Alexander's uh, amazing contribution during the war and the impact it had on medicine. If you yeah, I might just say that, that um, as Jenny describes in the book, in 1971, an author by the name of Glenn Infield published a book called Disasters at, Disaster at Barry, which was for the first time uh, publicly revealed uh, Stuart's role at Barry and at what was called the Little Pearl Harbor. But I don't recall ever discussing that book in any detail uh, with him. Well, I think what I think I'm going to do now, Michael, is take people through the events um, right. that were declassified then in 1970, because that was really the first time that um, the world heard about those events. And, uh, and Dr. Alexander began to talk for the first time about his very secret investigation and secret contribution um, that he made to medicine during the war. If you bear with me, I'm going to take you back to a night on December 2nd, 1943. And um, it took place in the old port town of Bari, which was on Italy, Italy's Adriatic coast. Um, it was a very uh, busy port. The British had taken the, the capital of Puglia in September, and the fighting was only 150 miles away, but the port was completely uh, intact. It had escaped any bombing and it was uh, just teeming with Allied soldiers. Um, it was the most important Mediterranean service hub, and it supplied the American 5th and the British 8th armies, and the better part of 500,000 Allied troops that were engaged in trying, trying to drive the Germans out of Italy. Um, the British controlled the port, and they were so convinced that they had decimated the surrounding German forces that the head of their um, air force, um, Sir Arthur Cunningham announced that he would regard it as a personal affront and insult if the Luftwaffe attempted any action in their area. Um, four days earlier, um, the American Liberty ship, the John Harvey, pulled in with a convoy of nine other cargo ships. Um, there were more than 30 Allied ships crammed into this harbor. They were, they were literally uh, tied up end to end. It was so crowded. Um, and they were... Um, they were filled with all of the, um, the goods that the soldiers needed to keep um, the advance on Rome going. Uh, they were filled with uh, engines, corrugated steel for landing strips, aviation fuel. On the upper decks of the boats, you could see tanks, armored personnel carriers, jeeps, ambulances, everything you can imagine. And um, the, the bright lights atop huge cranes that were uh, hoisting bombs and munitions up and out of the boats were working. Um, they were working literally around the clock. Uh, they had to get all of these supplies to the soldiers for the big push on Rome. Um, the American campaign in Italy had been uh, going for six months by that time and had not been going well. Losses had been very high and morale was low. And the success of their continuing advance uh, hinged on getting these supplies to the men. And so because of the enormous urgency to do so, they uh, suspended the usual blackout orders. And so the, the lights were blazing in Bari all night long as they unloaded these ships. Um, at 7.35 PM on the night of December 2nd, um, there was a blinding flash and a, and a terrible bang. And the German bombers came in low over the town, dropping the bombs. They used a secret weapon, a new kind of, of jamming technique that dropped clouds of foil strips down over the harbor and it confused the Allied radar and it allowed them to achieve virtually complete surprise. Um, they just rained bombs down on the harbor 
and they and they turned day into night. Uh, the gunners aboard the anchored ships scrambled to try to return fire, but it was too late. There was virtually no opposition, and the attacking German planes uh, pulled out basically unchallenged and unscathed. And although the raid lasted less than 20 minutes in all, the results were absolutely devastating. Um, the uh, the ammunition on the boats exploded and sent huge rolling mass of flames a uh, thousand feet high and then they rolled across um, the entire harbor uh, reporters at the time said that the water on the surface of the harbor was covered with burning oil a ruptured uh, fuel line um, sent thousands and thousands of gallons of aviation fuel gushing into the harbor and it basically ignited into a gigantic sheet of flame and then the flames jumped from boat to boat sort of like a prairie fire consuming everything in their in their way and although the crews worked frantically to try to douse the flames and save their ships they could not and most of them had to jump overboard and swim for it and it was it was a horrific scene News of the night raid on Bari was immediately acknowledged to be the worst naval catastrophe of the war, Pearl Harbor having taken place just before the war. And uh, it was immediately dubbed by the press corps as the Little Pearl Harbor. Um, it was, uh, from the very beginning, uh, downplayed by the by the American and British forces in an attempt to cover up how much damage was done. Uh, adding insult to injury, the first real report of the raid came from the Germans who gloated on a propaganda radio broadcast that they had picked off the Allied ships like sitting ducks. The, um, the attack uh, was so devastating that it really shook the complacency of the Allied forces. It sunk uh, 17 ships and destroyed more than 31,000 tons of cargo and it killed more than 1,000 and American and British sailors and wounded almost the same number and another hundreds and hundreds of Italian civilians. The real number will probably never be known. Uh, right away there were rumors of a cover-up and that there was uh, more to this incident that was being re revealed. There was talk that it might have been caused by a secret German weapon, a rocket-driven glide bomb. Um, there was a, a congressional inquiry was immediately formed and announced. Um, and Rear Admiral Emery Scott Land, who was responsible for the U.S. Merchant Marine Fleet, was so angry, he told Time Magazine, you're going to hear more about this raid before you hear less. Interestingly, that was the last official word anyone heard about the Bari incident. And for decades thereafter, it remained shrouded in mystery. And in the crucial hours and days that followed the bombing, the task of treating the gravely injured sailors was complicated by the absolute wartime secrecy and the determined efforts of both the American and British government to cover up the incident so as not to endanger the preparations for the most important operation of the war, Overlord, the Allied invasion of German-occupied France, which was planned for that spring. It would be almost 30 years before the world would learn the truth about what really took place on that fatal night. And even today, very few people are aware of the surprising consequences the disaster had and its impact on the lives of millions of Americans today. Um, Alexander, Dr. Alexander, was then a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel on Eisenhower's staff, and he was awoken in the middle of night and told that he'd been assigned to investigate the disaster. The British doctors had sent out a red light signal, an emergency alert essentially, saying that um, they had too many men dying too quickly of unexplained causes. And they were worried that the Germans had used some kind of new weapon. Alexander was uh, sent directly to Bari and uh, the situation that greeted him there was uh, grim to say the least. Uh, all the uh, equipment um, that had been planned for five American hospitals had been sunk and was at the bottom of the harbor. The doctors were all safe and they scrambled to help the British, whose hospitals were still intact, to treat the hundreds and hundreds of incoming wounded from the bombing. Um, but the lack of medical supplies was gonna make the situation uh, far worse. Um, the main hospital in Bari 
had luckily escaped uh, being bombed, but it was damaged. The windows were all shattered. Um, they had lost their power supply. They were plunged in darkness. They were trying to treat the incoming wounded by candlelight and lamplight. Um, all the men that came in, hundreds and hundreds lined up outside, uh, many of them dragging mangled limbs behind them. They were all covered in thick black crude oil. They had burns from having swum through the burning oil. Um, a death ward was set up in a back room to treat those, uh, to, 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 to put those that were beyond treatment, essentially. Um, in the remorseless calculation of triage, those that uh, could not be saved had to be put back there. In the basement, um, an Italian carpenter was already uh, banging together makeshift coffins because the town had run out of caskets. Um, there were so many hundreds and hundreds of patients needing urgent attention that it was impossible for the uh, medical staff to attend to everyone at once. Um, so a lot of the young sailors who had swum to safety or been plucked out of the uh, harbor by rescue boats were what they called immersion cases. They were suffering from what appeared to be shock. They'd been in the freezing cold water. They were uh, suffering from smoke inhalation and um, they were covered in this, this fuel oil. Um, and uh, other than that though, they, they appeared to be in relatively good condition. And so these uh, hundreds of sailors um, were just left sitting on their coats, on wet blankets in the hallways, um, really left to sit wherever they had collapsed. Um, they were given what was then the standard treatment um, a shot of morphine, blankets to keep them warm, and some strong, hot, sweet tea in the English uh, tradition. Um, and most of them had to sit there for 12, sometimes 24 hours before being seen by a doctor while they treated the, uh, the surgical cases first. The first indication that the British doctors had that there was something unusual was um, at dawn the next morning when some of the men... Uh, started ripping off their clothes, in some cases tearing off their bandages, saying that their skin was on fire. And then by the, by the light of the windows, the nurses could see that they had enormous blisters, uh, some the, the size of balloons, um, and their skin had turned a strange red inflamed color. Um, six hours after the attack, they started complaining of eye problems. The surgeons complained of watering eyes that were so bad it was difficult for them to work in the operating theaters. And um, by the end of the day, the wards were full of hundreds of men with their eyes swollen shut. Essentially, they had been blinded and they were panicked that they'd been blinded. And um, uh, many of the young sailors uh, 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 were, were panicked that they would never regain their sight and were, were asking what had happened to them. Patients that had been released um, because they seemed okay returned the next day in terrible condition. Um, and they did not know what to do for them. The nurses scrubbed the, the black oil off the bodies uh, when, they, when they peeled back their clothes and their underwear. They found the skin had been terribly burned. Um, and yet uh, what made it so difficult was that they, um, they had not seen wounds quite like this before when they consulted their medical textbooks from World War I and the chemical warfare service manuals that the army provided. Uh, the wounds did not fit the descriptions, and so they were somewhat mystified. Um, and then uh, real panic started to set in the hospitals when uh, they, re they received notification from the authorities that there might be a chance of blister gas exposure and that they should classify all of the burn victims as dermatitis NYD, not yet diagnosed, pending further instructions. The first unexplained death occurred 18 hours after the attack, and within two days, there were 14 boys that had died of unknown causes. Alexander was uh, uh, told all this as he toured the hospital and examined uh, the, the injured sailors. And the doctors described a, a, a startling downward spiral. Uh, soldiers that were 21, 21 years old, that, that appeared in very good condition, asked for a glass of water, sat up, chatted, suddenly would become moribund and die. Um, they suspected that it might 
possibly be mustard gas, but there was no mustard gas being used in World War II. Not only that, but mustard gas, which was earned its uh, name because of its sort of garlicky smell, not because it comes from mustard. Um, it attacked the respiratory organs and they would have expected to see a lot of that kind of injury, but they did not. Instead, they were seeing very different kinds of injuries. And so they, they, they worried that it might be some other weapon. Alexander, who had been trained in chemical weapons, knew that the Germans also possessed um, chemical weapons like phosphorus bombs that can cause chemical burns and eye damage. He also knew that some of the ships might be carrying a new American secret weapon called napalm that caused terrible burns. So he couldn't know exactly what the cause of the injuries was or if it was a nasty mix of several weapons. And until they knew they couldn't treat the wounds properly, they couldn't even give them pain medication for fear of how it might mix with what they were suffering from. So there was enormous urgency to get to the bottom of the problem. So as Alexander uh, walked the, the wards, he asked the men which ship they were on, what had happened to them, uh, what first aid they had received, how long had they waited at the docks, how long had they waited at the hospitals. And as he drew back the covers from the sailors and he looked at their bodies, he pretty rapidly came to see that there was a, a definite pattern. And you could even see red raised skin where the water has splashed, had splashed them. So he knew the burns were caused by something in the water, not just thermal burns, meaning fire and heat from explosions. So he began to suspect that it was something in the water. And he realized from interviewing men that the few men that had had the time or the initiative to uh, clean themselves off immediately had escaped with minimal damage. So um, he, was, he was fairly certain that some kind of chemical contaminant had gotten into the water. Now, as he'd walked the hospital, uh, there was an overwhelming uh, 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 smell of fuel oil and, uh, and burnt flesh and uh, urine and disinfectant and all the usual smells that, that fill a hospital ward. But he thought that um, as he'd entered the hospital that he had detected the scent of garlic and that would mean uh, mustard gas. And Alexander knew that mustard gas was in fact not a gas, it was a liquid and that it could have entered the water or it could have been released as a vapor and it would have injured the men in a variety of ways. He also knew the Germans had developed a new kind of mustard gas called nitrogen mustard, which was colorless and odorless and would be very difficult to detect. Now it was five days, uh, the men were dying. He was under enormous pressure to come to a diagnosis. So he confronted the British authorities at the port with his findings and he said, I think it's mustard gas. And the head of the hospital said, he had no knowledge of mustard gas. Alexander then pressed his case and said, um, did he have any way of knowing, did he have any prior knowledge that any boat in the harbor was carrying mustard gas? It was standard protocol that if an allied boat had such a toxic cargo that the port officials would be, knowledge, would be um, notified, usually that boat would be sequestered away from the other boats because it had dangerous target. A cargo, and the port officials would all be made aware of the dangerous cargo. He was told that the port officials had no knowledge of mustard gas on any allied ship, and they did not believe that mustard gas was the cause. Alexander felt that the officials were being evasive. It was a British port, and he sensed that he was not getting the full story or their full cooperation, and he realized that the burden of proof was on him. So the next morning he rose at dawn and he began to investigate the harbor. Um, it was a disaster site. Uh, he picked his way through mounds of rubble and twisted steel. And he, uh, and he, uh, he went out and looked at the, the skeletal remains really of the sunken ships. There were masts, broken masts rising up above the water. The water was black, uh, it was oil slimed. Uh, one sailor he had interviewed in the hospital told him that a foot of fuel oil had sat on top of the uh, water um, after the attack. And uh, he suspected that mustard gas had leached into the water. But he was trying to figure out how it would have happened. And if the German bombers had dropped mustard gas in an aerial attack, 
it would have sprayed all over the harbor. Hundreds and hundreds of men would have been covered and it would have contaminated all the boats in the harbor. And yet, as he went around the harbor uh, investigating and interviewing the uh, British Royal Navy personnel in the harbor, they told him there were no signs of mustard. He saw no people out on the docks uh, contaminating them. There were no signs of noxious materials. Uh, one personnel after another said, there's no mustard here. That's absolutely impossible. You're wrong. So uh, Alexander was in a bit of a quandary. He went back to the British officials and he stated this case, but this time he stated it very forcefully. He told them that of the 534 men that were admitted just the first day, 281 were suffering, in his opinion, from mustard gas poisoning. 45 had died that very day. He expected hundreds more would die, and he said that they were their countrymen, and were they really not going to talk to him? At that point, the British authorities wavered and told, them, told him that he thought it was possible that the Germans had dropped mustard gas. And... Uh, Alexander was shocked by this. It had very grave implications. Roosevelt and Churchill had previously announced in speeches that if the Germans resorted to poison gas, that the Allies would retaliate in force, in kind, meaning we would overwhelmingly uh, uh, retaliate using our own poison gas. So he knew that it had very grave implications. Um, and he felt that he had to immediately uh, contact his authorities. So he sent cables to Roosevelt and Churchill stating that he felt that the, the sailors in Bari had uh, suffered from mustard gas. And uh, just as he was uh, preparing his report, he received news that a diver had gone down and found the shattered shell casings and that they were from an M47 bomb. The German bombs, uh, Gelbkreuz, always had a yellow cross on them. This was an American mustard gas bomb. So he realized uh, to his horror that um, the Nazis in a lucky strike had hit the John Harvey and it had been carrying a secret cargo of 2000 mustard gas bombs, which we had brought in uh, just in case Hitler as a last resort uh, started using chemical weapons. Um, unfortunately, um, the poison gas uh, then uh, that we had brought in um, poisoned our own men. And Axis Sally, uh, the German propagandist, uh, actually went on the radio that night he heard from his room and was gloating that the uh, Allied sailors were choking on their own gas. Instead of um, solving problems, uh, he now had to deal with the fact that the British were covering up what was basically a tragic and also a humiliating accident that would be very bad for war morale. Uh, the response to his cables that he had sent to his superiors and to Roosevelt and Churchill um, were also complicated. While Roosevelt acknowledged uh, his report and asked to be kept informed, uh, Churchill continued to deny that there was any mustard gas in Bari. And Alexander understood why. He understood that the British concern was that if Hitler uh, learned there was mustard gas in Bari Harbor, he might retaliate and he would not retaliate on America. We were far away. He would start dropping poison gas um, on England. So Churchill maintained the absolute line that there was no mustard gas in Bari but Alexander tried to save as many of the sailors as he could, so he insisted on proper diagnosis and treatment. Um, that part of his investigation was finished, but the medical part of his investigation had really just begun because uh, while he was trying to save as many of the dying sailors as he could, most uh, at a certain point were beyond help. Um, but the one thing that Alexander realized was that these men had suffered from an absolutely unprecedented and very intimate and lengthy contact with mustard gas as a result of swimming in it and then being left to sit in their soaking uniforms for 12 to 24 hours. And that had produced an, um, an unprecedented event, which was that they had been able to see mustard gas's effects on the human body in ways that they had never seen before. And as he sat uh, studying the autopsy reports and the medical case histories, 
one recurring observation leapt out at him, the devastating effects on the sailors' white blood cell counts. And again and again, he saw the same result. Their white blood cell counts fell off sharply. And he noted that the lymphocytes, the white blood cells found in the lymph organs, which are so important for the immune system, were the first to vanish. And what he was looking at made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end because he had seen these results before, but never in human beings. In 1942, when he joined the army, he had been sent to train at the chemical warfare services labs at Edgewood Arsenal. And they had received smuggled samples of a new German mustard gas that they had, um, they had gotten and brought to uh, Edgewood Arsenal for the Americans to test. And Alexander had been in charge of the testing on the human body. And to their astonishment, the white blood cell counts of the rabbits that they um, exposed to mustard gas had dropped to zero. And nobody had ever seen results like this before. And not only that, but they had seen the deterioration of the lymph nodes and the bone marrow. And while they tried again and again um, to see if it was a bad batch of rabbits or whether something else was going on, they got the same astounding results. And Alexander, uh, became uh, sort of obsessed with the fact that the white blood cell counts disappeared, the lymph nodes shrunk, and that mustard gas appeared to interfere with the body's mechanism for producing blood cells, especially white blood cells. And if they attacked, if mustard gas attacked white blood cells, he wondered if it would attack the malignant white blood cells, for example, that, that, that cause leukemia, the most common type of cancer in children, in which the unrestrained white blood cell growth um, caused all the damage. And he wondered if mustard gas could be used in tiny um, titrated doses to destroy some, but not all of those cells without harming the patients. When he proposed this, um, he was told that it was not a, uh, uh, that he was not in the business of doing medical research or looking for miracle cures. He was in the weapons business and he should get back to business of um, treating uh, the, of looking at this nitrogen mustard and how to treat casualties. And that's what he was doing at Edge, Edgewood Arsenal. So he had to abandon his research back in 1942. But now, uh, and sitting in this hospital 6,000 miles away in Bari, he'd seen the same results. And he realized that he now had incontrovertible evidence that mustard gas selectively destroyed blood cells and blood forming organs. And that the reason they had never seen this before was they had never seen such an extraordinary level, level of sulfur mustard toxicity before. But it had never happened like this because World War I was fought largely on land. And it was, the, it was when the mustard mixed with the oil that the patients received such a large poisonous dose. And that allowed them to see its effects on the body for the first time. It had essentially taken a freak accident and the massive exposures of wartime to verify in people the results that they had seen in laboratory rabbits. And so for Alexander, he realized that um, what he had seen on the sailors in Bari could have enormous implications for cancer patients with leukemia or lymphosarcoma. It had taken, you know, it was a one in a million chance that had landed him, probably one of the few doctors in the world that knew of mustard's curative potential um, in the middle of a disaster with hundreds and hundreds of cases in the morgue to study. And it, it afforded him an unthinkably rare uh, chance to perform a pioneering investigation that would never have been possible um, on living volunteers in the same numbers. So he uh, ran around taking uh, skin samples, uh, ordering autopsies, collecting case histories, and he collected as much information as he could, and he sort of smuggled it out of Bari. Um, Churchill uh, was continuing to hold the line that there was no mustard gas in Bari. He was extremely angered by um, Alexander's investigation and he um, threatened him with court martial. But Alexander succeeded in writing a, his landmark report and uh, his bosses, uh, Eisenhower allowed him to write the report. It was classified 
but his immediate boss was Cornelius Dusty Rhodes, head of the Chemical Warfare Services Medical Division. He recognized the importance of the report immediately. And um, he basically organized a, a national effort to start investigating um, nitrogen mustard and its therapeutic potential. In his day job, he was head of something called Memorial Hospital in New York. And he found two benefactors in Charles Sloan and um, in Alfred P. Sloan and Charles Kettering of General Motors. And they backed a new research institute called the Sloan Kettering Institute, which began to refine mustard gas and turn it into the first medicine for cancer known today as chemotherapy. Um, it, it, it was uh, something that came out of the war and uh, it was something that, um, that doctors in the 19, uh, late 1940s and 50s knew had begun as a chemical weapon and was being refined as a cure. But that was soon uh, forgotten. And because the Bari incident remained classified and really until the 70s, um, few people and probably almost no patients knew. Um, and uh, I, if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read uh, the last paragraph of my book which was um, in September 2006, the year marking the 60th anniversary of the first report of a trial of cancer chemotherapy, Dr. Jules Hirsch paid tribute to Stuart Alexander in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And he reminded readers of the Bari disaster and the inquisitive physician investigator who quote, sifted through the horrors and extracted a gem something potentially useful for the abatement of human disease. Thank you. Can I uh, comment, Jenny? Yes, Michael, please comment. Well, I wanna say that Jenny spoke very rapidly and she, but she only gave the bare bones of the narrative. You gotta <laughs> read the book. It's filled with wonderful vignettes about all manner of interesting characters. Um, uh, Sloan and Kettering and Rhodes. Uh, there was an incident when um, uh, uh, Dr. Alexander went to, up to Yale, to New Haven, to meet with the leading authority on war gases, Milton Winternitz, who himself was a very controversial character, uh, um, powerful character. <laughs> to say the least. And uh, when uh, Stewart uh, explained what he found in rabbits, um, characteristically, Winternitz just gave him the cold shoulder and was very rude. Um, but that didn't stop him two years later when the rabbit studies that he had done at Edgewater, Edgewood um, turned out to be uh, toxic in, in sailors. And at that point, Winternitz gave his uh, Stewart's findings to two young pharmacologists that everybody who has ever studied pharmacology knows their names, um, Goodman and Gilman. Right. Um, Lewis Goodman and Alfred Gilman, who wrote the classic textbook in that field. And so in fact, they did, you know, just, so, just so people know, they did the first study on human beings um, in, a, in a hospital in America showing that mustard gas in, in, in tiny doses could be um, used uh, to cause tumor regression. Um, they had seven patients in all. Uh, they, they were successful. It was temporary regression, but it, 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 it was an enormous cause for optimism. Um, the Bari report, with its hundreds of, of uh, cases, uh, provided further evidence and a great impetus then to follow this line of research to develop chemotherapy. I'd like to say one other thing. Um, at the start of the book, um, just after the title page, Janet uh, provides two quotations. We've already heard Pasteur, but she quotes Winston Churchill and Walt Whitman. And in the first, Churchill once said that in wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. 
<laughs> and probably he meant that deception and subterfuge sometimes are justified. But if that's true, the very incident was an example of Churchill acting out this maxim, but to a fault. And the second quote by Whit Whitman that she included was during the Civil War, and he wrote, the real war will never get in the books. But projecting forward to World War II, Walt Whitman was only partially correct. And that's because it took more than seven decades until Jeanette Conan went to work. And the great secret was out. And now by reading her book, you too can learn the real story behind the official narrative. Stuart Alexander was a modest and mild-mannered man. He seemed to lack any ego. Uh, he enjoyed uh, teaching young people who were starting out in medicine. Um, and um, he, he, with us, established a wonderful program at our hospital, a summer externship for pre-medical students who were contemplating a medical life. What Walt Whitman might have called the real story that never gets depicted on television programs. He was a very nice man, and tragically, um, he uh, he died of um, a malignant melanoma, skin cancer, which he uh, diagnosed himself. But um, in a story that's full of twists and turns, I'm not going to tell you the last twist, which was how 45 years after his um, heroics in uh, Bari, he was finally recognized by the army. Uh, for his work in saving lives and being a catalyst for the development of chemotherapy. For that, you have to read the book. Now I think we should try and take some questions if there are some from uh, the audience. Um, do we have those? Yes. Ashan. Yes. Um, would we still, anyone who would like to ask a question please uh, add it to the Q&A box. We don't have any just yet. Okay. Um, so if you would like, you two may continue on and I can... One of the things um, that I think is, is interesting for people to know is that the, is how quickly this all happened. So Alexander's uh, final report uh, was published in the spring of 1944 and he gave it to Dusty Rhodes who immediately took it and began ordering secret um, research on mustard gas to turn it into chemotherapy. Um, by uh, 1946, uh, Goodman and Gilman studies at Yale were published and laboratories across the United States were working on refining mustard gas and uh, were trying to treat patients with it. Um, the first mustard gas um, uh, extract that was safe enough to use for clinical use was called mustardgen and it was approved by the FDA in 1949. Um, Sloan Kettering doctors announced their first progress in treating adults uh, with acute leukemia, um, just as Alexander had predicted. Uh, in the early years, um, you know, progress was very slow. The remissions were few and fleeting. Uh, the toxic side effects of a uh, chemical weapon, really, which were nausea and vomiting and hair loss uh, caused by this very aggressive treatment were truly terrible, but they made enormous progress in, uh, in mitigating those um, uh, side effects. And Alexander lived to see his research into mustard gas help lead a, to the creation of a whole new class of chemotherapeutic drugs, which um, succeeded in prolonging the life of patients, and many of them are still in wide use today. Um, by 1953, uh, the new medicine 6MP and methotrexate were, produce, were shown to produce remissions in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, uh, which was the most common childhood cancer and was invariably fatal. Today, with the use of combina combination chemotherapy, more than 90% of children with ALL can be cured. Um, the medical triumphs, uh, these medical triumphs uh, that that came out of the Bari disaster led the American Cancer Society to credit that World War II tragedy with initiating, quote, the modern age of cancer chemotherapy. So it's quite a tale from beginning to end. With your permission, Jenny, I'd like to tell the story of Dr. of Lieutenant Colonel Vetter 
uh, also at Edgewood Arsenal. One of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, fascinated both myself and Dr. Nevins is that when Alexander uh, first arrived at the Chemical Warfare Service, he essentially took a crash course in poison gas. It's one reason he was able to be um, so uh, quick on his feet at the Bari disaster. He had been very well trained. Um, and uh, he learned the history of poison gas uh, treatment and, and, uh, and, and developments. And so what uh, Dr. Nevis is referring to is one of the earlier army uh, experts in poison gas that he studied. Yeah, after the Spanish flu of 1918, millions of people worldwide were killed. And so they were doing research and on guinea pigs, and they found out that a concentration of mustard and tuberculosis bacilli um, seemed to have a positive effect. It prevented flu. Um, and then there was an accidental leak, and some of the workers were exposed, and they seemed to have less respiratory infections. That was chlorine gas at the time, I think, that they were... They Correct. were Chlor chlorine yeah. gas. One of the yeah. popular poison gases from World War I. Right, so the uh, Chemical Warfare Service uh, had got a bad reputation in World War I, so they wanted to seize on something positive. And so they <laughs> popularized the idea, they had lavish publicity. And in 1924, President Calvin Coolidge uh, underwent three doses of this chlorine gas in a chamber and breathed it in and he, he said it was so successful that the next year uh, America, they wanted to convince Americans that breathing the fumes was good for you. That was, so they, 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 the tagline was chlorine gas cured the common cold. There you go. And so they had an event in, in the, on Capitol Hill and they blocked off a room and they gassed 23 senators, 146 congressmen, thousands of staff members and friends and families. And it wasn't, uh, records were not kept, but apparently nobody died. Um, but for the first time, they had this treatment for common cold. Right. So it fell out of favor, but I think that the current uh, resident of the White House probably would be very <laughs> interested in this innovative type of treatment. <laughs> Uh, yes. You know, don't give him any ideas, Michael. <laughs> you know, so we, we do have a, well, rather large influx of questions now. Um, if you would like, we can try to get to some before sure. we run out of time. Um, so, let me see. Um, Barbara wants to know if you are aware of um, if the parents of the sick or dead service people were informed of how they were really killed or was that part of the kind of cover up as well? That's a very good question. And uh, the, the very sad answer is no, they were not. The cover up was absolute. Um, when Churchill um, had um, Alexander removed from the port of Bari, he um, had all of the military records, the mustard gas stricken from all of the military records. In fact, um, they even went into the patient's medical charts and they removed the term mustard gas that Alexander had written in as a diagnosis. They removed Alexander's name and the diagnosis of the injuries and the cause of death was put down to burns due to enemy action, which was a fairly generic term at the time. Um, uh, tragically, uh, many of the sailors who survived um, went on to suffer a lifetime of medical issues, everything from uh, respiratory diseases and, and, and severe asthma to uh, glaucoma, uh, skin cancers, uh, you name it. Um, they were never told the real cause of their ailments. Uh, they incurred you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in medical bills and it wasn't until a lawsuit in England by a very sick and dying uh, uh, Bari veteran um, on one of the British ships who sued uh, and finally got the British government to acknowledge that mustard gas was, official, was officially used 
at Bari and that he was uh, entitled to back medical compensation. That opened the way for, uh, this was, remember, uh, 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 long after the war, so most of the veterans were dead, but the uh, several dozen that were still alive were, were given back medical compensation. And then in 1991, the American Veterans Association uh, made the same request that the veterans that were still remaining um, should be given back medical compensation. And a huge report was done called Veterans at Risk, um, showing that the thousands of American veterans, not just the hundreds that survived the Bari incident, but the thousands that were exposed in tests of mustard gas um, at the various um, arsenals while they were developing the gas and developing protective gear for the gas. The doctors and nurses, all the, the personnel that had been exposed were never properly um, advised of the side effects and were never given proper medical com compensation. And it was declared to be a, 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 you know, a tragedy and a shame that they had basically uh, been put at risk twice by their country. So that's a long answer to your question, but no, the cover-up meant that the, most of the victims' uh, families were never told the truth. All right, Daniel asks, uh, did Dr. Alexander continue to study chemotherapy during his clinical career? Uh, no, uh, the simple answer is no. He, his father, um, as Dr. Nevins had explained earlier, his, his father um, was a beloved uh, doctor in New Jersey who had this family practice, had delivered thousands of babies in the community. Um, Alexander had promised him when he went off to war that when he returned, he would return to continue the family practice. Um, and he did that. Um, he was himself a revered and, and beloved uh, doctor in New Jersey and was a uh, uh, a longtime director of Bergen Pines County Hospital and uh, an eminent uh, local figure. He followed the uh, with great interest the developments in the field of, of cancer chemotherapy. And of course, he started to receive um, publicity once uh, the documents uh, became declassified in the 70s, bit by bit. And, and in the end of the book, I, I tell that whole story in detail. I think it should be pointed out, though, that Dusty Rhodes was so uh, impressed by young Dr. Alexander that he offered him a position as his assistant in the new Sloan Kettering Institute, but Stewart thought better of it. He had promises to keep. He also, the $3,000 annual salary might not be enough to feed his, his growing family, and so he graciously turned it down. <laughs> Um, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but here's one um, from Molly. Um, she says she has had some family members go through chemo, and she's never heard any of this information before. So she's wondering, how did you come across this fascinating information? How, like, what was your research? Uh, well, I, as I explained at the at the very top of the hour. Um, my grandfather was in charge of developing all chemical weapons in, in World War II, so I found a reference to this disaster in his papers. And, um, and I started doing the research, and, um, and I had two very, very wonderful research assistants, Ruth Tenenbaum in America, going through all the American archives, and then uh, one going through all the Imperial archives in London. And uh, there was enormous amount of classified research that had become available over the years um, that people didn't realize was now available. And so we really got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents. And then I was very fortunate that Alexander's family generously provided me with all of his diaries, his letters, his reports, um, his unpublished memoir, um, so I had an enormous amount of his papers and documents as well. So I had a, a, a really a treasure trove of, of, of unpublished material to use for the book. Excellent. And we're running up against the end of our time. So there is one last question that I wanted to pose to both uh, you, Jeanette, and Dr. Nevins. And that is uh, what we ask of every author here. What book if any, are you currently reading? <laughs> and if you are reading one, could you please share that with us? Well, this probably won't surprise readers, but in my downtime when I'm not working, 
I read murder mysteries. So um, I'm incredibly excited to be reading Kate Atkinson's new book, um, Blue Sky. I wait for each of her new books. And so um, I'm, I'm quite happy right now. <laughs> Michael? Oh, of course, I can't resist uh, <laughs> recommending my own new book, <laughs> COVID Ramblings, A Medical Historian Digresses. But truly, um, because I'm interested in medical history and medical ethics, I'm reading now a wonderful book by Dr. Baron Lerner, who writes about his, uh, again, a father and a son. His father was a prominent Boston he, um, uh, a physician who I knew in medical school, and it's about how each of them uh, were typical of their different times. His father was a paternalistic type of doctor who believed doctor knows best. Um, the son uh, is a believer that patients should make up their own minds and, and we should respect their autonomy. And it's a fascinating book, and it's called um, The Good Doctor, A Father, A Son, and the evolution of medical ethics. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us this evening. And of course, I'd like to thank Jeanette and Dr. Nevins for this wonderful event. Um, we look forward to seeing you again and hopefully you all can join us for another PMP Live event. Okay, thank you. Michael, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good evening.